Hello, Hello and, and welcome, welcome to, to ETV. ETV. I'm Ted. And I'm Parisa. And this is the first episode of Everything Edinburgh. Everything Edinburgh is our monthly news programme where we bring you the best aspects of student life. And today on this blustery day we've covered everything from Quidditch to the rugby pitch, so it's sure to be a great watch. Opening today's show is the lifestyle section where we bring you what's happening in our great city. This month, Edinburgh's had a visit from Bollywood's biggest star. And something's been brewing in Edinburgh's first ever coffee festival. We sent Molly and Seb to find out a little bit more. And freshers, listen up, because we've been sending our reporters out to find the best tips and tricks on how to survive your first term. This is so embarrassing. If I were younger... If we were younger... Who was asking the questions? When it's flaming, it's fun. Uh, sleep. Baked beans. Baked beans. Baraka. Peppermint tea. tea. <laughs> Coconut water. Coconut water. All the carbs. Oh, snacks cafe. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about your grades. Uh, Don't go out every freshers night. Right? Do you yeah, go out yeah, every freshers night. Oh. Get really involved in the first year, do everything. The human resources, you can, and the people, my classmates are very friendly and helpful. Go to the library just like once in a week, just in case. First year doesn't count, so just have, have a party. Um, the pub. <laughs> Petri. Um, <laughs> Pongos. <laughs> Opal. Probably. A dinner party in a flat. Sneaky Pete's. Oh. Nothing with Sambuca. Sambuca and anything? Yeah. Tequila and Sambuca. Maybe a Jaeger bomb? <laughs> uh, vodka with beer? Study. Just do it. Just do it when you can. Like, yeah. keep Work up. From the start. Mm. Don't intercalate if you're studying medicine. I like to make a diary plan. I think you need to to try some jobs. Read. Mm, the quietest spot is the ninth floor of DHT because it's completely stripped out of everything. Fun fact. History common room. <laughs> Fourth floor. Not near the lifts. Second floor library by the max. Fifth floor. Fifth floor. Mm. Fifth floor. I like to just go back to my bed and nap. I haven't found that yet, but I'm still looking. I need that answer. I was speaking of fear the other day. <laughs> Tutorials. <laughs> the lift. Uh, cult. Cult cafe. Film house cafe. Picnic basket, is that what it's called? Yeah, picnic, yeah, picnic basket. Yeah. We like um, that. The brew lab. Oh, good, yeah. Love crumbs. Library cafe. Um, where are you from? Where they're from? <laughs> yeah, which floor in the library they study? Uh, like some gum. <laughs> Have you done it? No. I'm just gonna say no, 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 no. Go no. on. No, no. Go on. No, it's inappropriate. What's your horoscope? That's all. <laughs> Shah Rukh Khan continues to be one of the most successful actors ever produced by Bollywood cinema, the largest film industry in the world. For over two decades, he has starred in some of Bollywood's most successful blockbusters, including Kush Kush Hata Hai, which was filmed here in Scotland. Khan is not only recognised for his acting abilities, but also for his outstanding contributions to society. In fact, just last week he was here at New College where he received an honorary doctorate presented by Princess Anne in recognition of his philanthropic work. Khan's charitable actions have been mainly focused in India, where he brought solar power to rural villages, created a children's ward at a Mumbai hospital and supported relief funds to assist areas destroyed by tsunamis. Throughout the years, Khan has also been a valuable donor to cancer research. Whilst his philanthropic contributions are evident, he also happens to be known as the king of Bollywood cinema. He has appeared in over 80 Bollywood films over the years and received 14 Filmfare Awards, the Indian equivalent to the Oscars. After receiving his award, Khan went on to deliver a public lecture where he spoke about his happiness, success 
and lessons learned throughout his career. When, you, uh, when you're honoured by a university, uh, such a prestigious place, and by the people, uh, Her Royal Highness and everyone being so gracious to be present there, uh, it kind of makes you, you know, look back upon what you've been doing, where you started from, and uh, you know, just just take a pause, a moment, and say, "This is not happening to me. I never imagined myself uh, to be conferred with an award or an honor like this." Uh, it's extremely uh, humbling, and for the first time, when I was taking the uh, uh, the doctorate, I, I just realized it's not because of an individual effort. Uh, there are lots of people who've been involved in uh, where I'm standing today and receiving this honor from the University of Edinburgh. Um, colleagues, co-actors, um, co-workers, my family. And, uh, you know, it's an acknowledgement for all the work they've put in. I'm just the face of it. So it's, it's extremely humbling. Uh, but I'm not complaining. I like the doctorate. After his speech, Khan went on to perform the famous Lunji dance for the audience. why the university decided to award a Bollywood superstar with such a prestigious degree. But in fact the university has been linked to India for almost 250 years, which is why this is such a notable event. Khan is clearly loved and adored by fans all over the globe. And it was an honour to have him here at our university. Bit of a change and thought yeah. it was like a nice, a nice day, and yeah. we all love coffee. Uh, well, I'm a big fan of coffee, yeah. so I figured I had to come. Caffeine, coffee, cake, cocktails. Oh, beautiful! What does coffee mean to you? Coffee. Oh, just, that's a difficult question because it depends on what yeah. time of day. Sometimes it's just a. I need a shot first thing in the morning to get me going. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a sitting down reading a. Uh, a magazine or playing on my phone in a coffee shop. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's just sitting down with family yeah. at the okay. end of a day. And are you an avid coffee fan? Uh, yes. What's your favourite coffee? Um, don't really have one. Um, just, I don't know, I think it's the caffeine kick. I probably shouldn't say that, but... The caffeine kick. Yeah. <laughs> Mercy Corps is the charity partner of the Coffee Festival and we are the partner because we work with coffee and tea and chocolate growers all over the world from like Latin America, Indonesia, India, all these places and we work with the people behind the cup of coffee. So if your coffee isn't fair trade, how much do the farmers really get? Well, it's hard to say. There's different processes through fair trade, but when you support charities like Mercy Corps or you choose carefully which coffees and things you buy, you can be sure that they're not just getting better sales on their coffee, but they're getting support in other things. Like one of the things we do is support farmers in the dry months, so after they've harvested, and we teach them how to do things like grow more nutritious food so that they have income and they have other things to grow during the year. We help them diversify their crops into cocoa or cardamom or other things so that they could take advantage of a few different markets so it's about right. like building their strength that sounds great so can you just talk us through what's in this fine cocktail right yeah of course so what we've got is we have Bickering's 1947 gin which we make up in summer hall by the way um, and then we use Mr Ian's uh, cold press coffee um, it's an Indian coffee and an Indian gin recipe, so we thought they would go brilliantly together. Um, and then all we've done really is, is do one part coffee, one part gin, and then top it off with one part cream soda as well. We thought we figured, you know, we, we like to try and do lots and lots of interesting things with our gin. You know, yeah. gin is just this fantastic spirit. Yeah. It's so versatile, Not it's so complex. Yeah. Um, and we make it just up the road in Summer Hall. Um, okay. And Mr. Ian, who we're doing, who provides our coffee, mm -hmm. uh, he works down in Stock Bridge. So we thought it would be a brilliant opportunity yeah. to sort of take advantage of two local producers and do something fun and yeah, interesting, yeah, yeah. something that people don't expect. I think it's probably good for Edinburgh generally because I'm oh, sure no, yeah, it people from around, and it's good for like new coffee shops yeah. and like independent coffee shops and things because there's quite a lot Beautiful. of chains around but it's good to have yeah yeah yeah, yeah absolutely do you like coffee yeah no 
She Which, does, really. What do you think is an appropriate age for your child to start, start drinking coffee if you are obviously coffee enthusiasts? Yeah, I suspect six months and above is probably fine. Okay. Yeah, start with decaf though, obviously. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. Yeah. And if you were a coffee, what would you be? <laughs> Say a double macchiato. Okay, good choice. Because it's smooth, but it's got character. I'd probably be something South American. Yeah. Um, a bit exotic. Guatemalan. Guatemalan coffee. Yeah. It would be a, a little single espresso. I guess it would be a cappuccino. A cappuccino? Yeah. All sugary sweet with a little chocolate on top. No, not sugary and sweet. Fluffy but with depth. We had a wonderful morning at the Edinburgh Coffee Festival and you should definitely check out some of the coffee shops around Edinburgh. Loads have got student discounts and whatnot, so it's perfect to go and have a look around. I've been Seb. And I'm Molly. And this has been Edinburgh University Television. Looks like they like that a latte. <laughs> now it's time for the politics section, where we take a look at the biggest issues around campus. And our reporter Rob goes on a mission to find out a bit more about our student union and what it can do for us. Meanwhile, Aaron looks into the climate change debate, an issue that's really galvanised our student campus in the last year or so. We're going to be talking about USA, Edinburgh University Student Association. They were founded in 1884, which makes them the oldest student union in the country and arguably the grandest. But as a student, what have they actually done? What have they actually achieved this year? That's what we're going to find out. We spoke to students around George Square. First of all, what does USA actually stand for? Uh, Edinburgh University Students Association. University of Edinburgh Students Association. Okay. Edinburgh University Students Association. University of Edinburgh Students Association. Okay, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, yeah. same. <laughs> <laughs> So that was a great start, but do they actually know anything about USA's policies? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, not, not, not particularly the student association, no. No. Quantifiably, no. So the students aren't too clear about USA's policies, but do they know who the president is? Oh, no. You don't know? No, I don't. President of USA. Uh, Johnny Ross Tatum. We'll pass him over earlier, actually, yeah. Um, it's Rock Obama. <laughs> no, kidding, I'm no kidding, I kidding. knew his name. Johnny. 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 Yeah. yeah, but he's a good looking guy. Like, <laughs> all... I remember. He's um, really nice. After hearing some of your thoughts about USA, I'm here at Potter Road to talk to the USA president, Johnny Ross Tatum. What does Johnny think students' impressions are of USA? Well, I'm sure there's quite a mix, <laughs> and it depends on who you ask as well. But across the university, there's thousands of students involved in USA societies, 25,000 of them. Uh, there are thousands of students who use our venues, TV at Potter Row, Pleasance, King's Buildings House, and a lot of those who use, the, who use and interact with Student Union in different ways will have different opinions. As a four, we've already done some really good things this year, like getting free sanitary products for all at the advice place. Imogen's been working on getting a gender studies course out there. Andy and I have been prioritizing men student mental health and well-being. And we're only a few months in and we've already done quite a few really positive things and there's hopefully a lot more to come this year. So far this year, USA has set up a wellbeing fund, campaigned for free Wednesday afternoons and campaigned for healthy, affordable food on campus. And what else? This is something actually new that wasn't on my manifesto, seeing if we can do some renovation in King's Building's house, seeing if we can get new food offers at King's Building's, I think that's really important, and linking that to providing a more better variety of food on, on all our campuses. So what can USA do to engage more students? But we need to communicate really clearly about what we're doing and get as many students involved in shaping their students' union as possible. Stay tuned to EU TV Politics for more USA stories throughout the year. Behind me, Charles Stewart House, one of the famous scenes in Edinburgh's history, or Edinburgh University's history. 30 students gathered here in May for 10 days of protests to challenge the university's reluctance to divest from fossil fuel companies. Fortunately, they won, and divestment has now become an actual policy. This campaign, though, wasn't without its issues. Pictured here is a student thrown to the ground by external security brought in by the university. We spoke to someone from People and Planet about their side of things. We were hoping that the university were going to divest um, from fossil fuels like we've been campaigning for for over three years. Um, but when they didn't, um, yeah, we were very, very, we were, yeah, pretty distraught. It enabled a really broad movement of, of students, like staff, other like community action groups from around the city to really be focused in on, on a point and, and mobilise um, and to get to know a bit more about the wider climate movement and the divestment movement in general. Um, we got so much messages of like solidarity from 
from other divestment groups in the US, in Australia, in like Hong Kong. We took to campus to find out what you know about the upcoming United Nations Climate Change Conference and what you currently do for our environment. Uh, I don't. Not entirely either. I just know it's major world countries coming together to discuss the effects of climate change. Um, I heard about it. Well, I tell her off when she uh, uses too much hot water. Well, I do the recycling thing. <laughs> yeah, we do the yeah. we do the recycling. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Recycle clothes, buy clothes second hand. One person can't really, really make a difference unless you kind of come together with other people and tell people about it. So. Outside of People and Planet, how else can our Edinburgh University students get behind the cause and get involved? Yeah, well, there's there's a numerous campaigns going on in the city um, that don't involve that much time commitment, but um, can be yeah really good. I mean, I'm. I'm Mostly involved with like the health impacts of climate change, the stuff on like air pollution, fuel poverty, making people realise that the impacts of climate change are felt on a very personal level. It's clear then that the environment is a huge part of our Edinburgh way of life. And if the UN can get a legally binding agreement in the upcoming Conference of Parties, then this polar bear could have something to hope for. Now for sports, where over the year we'll be spending time with Edinburgh sports teams both on and off the pitch. Today, sports producer Matt Ford presents a special feature on the epic rugby varsity match that took place at the start of term. And our reporter Flo has been spending time with the Edinburgh Shinty Club to get a taste of that very Scottish sport. Welcome to Murrayfield for EU TV's coverage of the Scottish varsity match. Dating back over 150 years, it's the oldest of its kind in the UK. And today, Edinburgh and St Andrews will lock horns for those all-important bragging rights. Earlier in the day, Edinburgh's seconds and thirds were in action on the back pitches at Murrayfield. Edinburgh came out on top, putting in consistently strong performances. And in the stadium, seats were filling up quickly in anticipation of the day's main action. Edinburgh's women started strongly and were ahead through Lisa Thompson's first minute breakout try, setting the bar high for her team's performance. This high tempo quickly established a commanding lead as Edinburgh found themselves 24-0 up at the half. In the second half, St Andrews responded with a try of their own to register their first and only points of the game. The game's final points, however, would go to Edinburgh, who extended their lead to 36-7 following a successful conversion. This superb win, combined with early results, meant that Edinburgh had claimed the overall varsity championship. Uh, we're here with uh, University of Edinburgh's uh, Lisa Thompson after the varsity game today. Uh, Lisa, just, just to start with, a uh, hat-trick at Murrayfield. First half hat trick as well in a winning team performance. You must be absolutely delighted. Yeah, I'm very proud to play on Murrayfield with that team. Just started out with a team, very good team performance. I couldn't have scored those tries for the team. Great team. Um, and obviously the, to, to win the game as well. I mean, uh, this is the 16th consecutive win against St Andrews. I mean, the formidable performance. I mean, it, the tempo you started with that just really set the tone. Yeah, definitely. We need to keep high intensity. It's only a 40 minute game, yeah. so we need to play high, high intensity, full 40 minutes, and we got the result we wanted. <laughs> The final match of the day was the men's first 15, and as the oldest varsity match in the world, the stakes were high. St Andrews were quickly on the front foot, and after establishing a two-try lead, seemed firmly in control. But for Edinburgh, the story wasn't over, as the team belatedly kicked into life. Despite Edinburgh's remarkable comeback to come from 17 points down to lead 26-20, in the dying moments of the game, St Andrews scored a dramatic last-minute try to put their team within a kick of victory. St Andrews, pure elation, 
For Edinburgh, bitter disappointment. Uh, we're here with uh, Will, Will Stephen from uh, the University of Edinburgh's uh, men's team. After that dramatic finish, uh, Will, can you quite sum up how, how devastating that feels? Pretty go. Pretty, pretty go looking at that, to be honest. Um, yeah, I didn't even watch the kick, so... Uh, but it was, it's just a game which is toed and throwed, and no, they deserved it. We were absolutely shot at the end, and uh, I think discipline perhaps lays down just to the end. Uh, if we, I think, if we kept our full body and men on the pitch, we might have, uh, we might have uh, sneaked it. But oh. how proud of you are the players, though, having bounced back from 17 0 down to get yeah, in front? Yeah. That yeah. shows tremendous yeah. character. And uh, hats off to the pack because uh, they, they were dominant for 60 minutes there. They, uh, they had, uh, to be honest, uh, bullied them a bit up front, and uh, it's just you just can't go 17 0 down to a side like that and expect to win a game. From a personal point of view, to score the try that got, got Edinburgh in front, obviously to come out uh, on, the, on the losing side, is that dampen the individual moment for you? Yeah, but yeah, for me it doesn't mean anything, does it? So, um, yeah, seeing them there is pretty, pretty gutting in all honesty. Um, yeah, it's the last time, it's the last time I remember we play here, so um, obviously, personally, it's nice to have that memory, but it would have been uh, even better to be lifting that trophy up there. And so that brings an end to proceedings here at BT Mowfield this afternoon at Scottish Varsity Rugby Match. Earlier the Edinburgh women beat St Andrews to claim the spoils in that one, but the men unfortunately were left disappointed after a last minute conversion from St Andrews stole the show. It brings an end to what has been a fantastic afternoon of rugby, showcasing the best from university sport in front of what was an absolutely fantastic crowd here at BT Murrayfield. From all of us here at EU TV, a landmark day for us with our first broadcast. I'm Matt Ford, sports producer and special correspondent. Thanks so much for watching and until next time, goodbye. So we are at Pepper Mill today and uh, we're going to be checking out the University of Edinburgh's Shinty teams. Shinty is a very interesting game, a little Scottish traditional game. So we're here, we're going to speak to a couple of people and we're going to find out a bit more about the game. So I am here with Isla Mackay and uh, she is the captain of the Lady Shinty team at Edinburgh and I'm just going to talk to her a little bit about Shinty, uh, not massively well known across the UK uh, but quite a popular sport in Edinburgh. Your experiences of Shinty? Um, so I'm from the Highlands, okay. so that's probably where the majority of Shinty is played because um, it originally is more um, of a Gaelic community based sport um, and used to be played um, pre-battle and stuff like that so um, it's, it's very community based in the Highlands. Um, I was taught, yeah, I was taught it when I was four um, right through till I left to go to uni. It's similar to hockey and ice hockey. Some say that ice hockey originated from Shinty when the Scots went over to Canada and played Shinty on the ice around the 1700s. And you mentioned uh, mixed teams, which is really cool actually. I think a, yeah. that's, a lot of people are attracted to that and you're actually going to be a, you're a sub for the guys today. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in terms of, you know, it's a really physical game, is that quite difficult when you're playing mixed teams? Well, yeah, it's a physical game. There's some horror stories. I do have one as well. Um, but that's why we have protection as well to get your shin pads. Some people claim that Quidditch and Harry Potter was based on Shinty. What's your personal opinion on that? Um, considering the snitch um, is quite fast and small, um, the shinty ball is fast and small as well, but, um, and you can play in the air obviously. Um, I would say it's more likened to lacrosse, but considering JK Rowling did write it in Scotland, maybe she had some influence there. I think it's getting more popular as other sports are sort of dying out. Yeah, um, I think quite a lot of people like the community feel of shinty. It's not the biggest team in Edinburgh Uni, um, but throughout um, Britain there's actually, you have a team in London now, Cambridge, Exeter, um, there's like spreading quite a lot. Um, there's an Australian Cam Act, an American one, apparently there's a Russian team now. So like it's spreading out, obviously people like moving around the planet as well, bringing it around. Thanks to Isla McKay and the rest of the University of Edinburgh Shinty team, this has been Floyd Lloyd Hughes at Pepper Mill for EU TV. 
From knitting to pottery, here at Edinburgh, there's a society for almost everything. And our society spotlight is here to show off the most weird and wonderful clubs and give them a chance to shine. This month, our two resident muggles, Alistair and Maddie, have been following the Harry Potter Society and bagged themselves tickets to the Quidditch National Championships. Then, Alistair's off to see what's been cooking with the Baking Society. Mr and Mrs Dursley of number 4 Privet Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. These words have been read by millions of people all around the world. They've been translated into 74 different languages and sparked a brand that's estimated to be worth over $15 billion. And they were written right here in Edinburgh's Elephant House Cafe. Now, some 18 years later, the Harry Potter series has grown cult-like status. No least here in Edinburgh, where the university has its own Harry Potter society. Okay, so we're quite a big society. We have weekly events. We do different things every week. Basically, anything from the books of the universe that we can make into an event, we try and do it somehow. So, I mean, this is the first time we've done this event. Um, try and you know, bring as much magic into the muggle life as we can. Um, I think everyone that's on the committee right now has all made their university friends through the society. Um, we all come in because we like Harry Potter, but we kind of come away with so much more. The Quidditch season had begun. On Saturday, Harry would be playing his first match after weeks of training, Gryffindor versus Slytherin. If Gryffindor won, they would move up into second place in the House Championship. The unexpected phenomenon which has come out of the Harry Potter series is the rise of Quidditch as a sport. Of course, technology hasn't mastered flying broomsticks just yet, but our reporter Maddie Harris went to find out how it's played. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to do a drill and we're going to go into a game, we'll play some more games later. We're going to do a drill and the games with Maddie can get a chance to play some Quidditch. So there are four positions. There are keepers, chasers, beaters and seekers. The keepers and chasers are both the quaffle, uh, both the quaffle players. Uh, their job is to try and pass the ball up and score through those hoops. Keeper is also like a chaser in that they can do all that, but within their keeper zone, they are not allowed to be beat or tackled. Um, ta I, I would say tackling is quite a major part of this game as well, it's really physical. Uh, the beaters, their job is to beat the chasers or the beaters or the seekers out the game. When people are beat, they have to come off their broom and re run back to their hoops before they can remount and rejoin the game. Uh, their, their job is to try and stop the opposition seeker catching the snitch and the chasers scoring goals. Uh, then the seeker, the seeker's job, as I mentioned, is to try and catch the snitch, which is a person dressed all in yellow with a sock and a tennis ball. I would say if you want to meet some of the greatest human beings you've ever met, if you want to have fun, if you want to get fit, if you want to change your life, if you want an experience you're going to remember for years and one that's really going to just dramatically reassess everything of how you look at people, how you play, how you live your life, how you define yourself as a character, your very core, well then I'd recommend Quidditch to you. The Elephant House is famous for much more than just Harry Potter, it's got pretty good cake too. But from cupcakes to meringues, home baking in the UK has seen a massive rise in popularity. One of the university societies looks to prove that students can do a lot more than just super noodles and spaghetti hoops. I went to meet Strun from the Baking Society who agreed to give me a quick lesson. From the baking society. Yeah, from the baking society. What are you going to bake for us? So today I'm going to make a chocolate swiss roll um, and make it look like a chocolate block. So the baking society meets every Thursday um, and they, every, so everyone brings along bakes to, um, we go to the David Hume Tower Cafe, we bring along bakes and basically we just get to try out each other's bakes and then we decide on 
what everyone's favourite bake was, so we all get a vote on that, and then that person gets a star maker sticker. The idea uh, of baking a cake is a really nice thing, and then obviously you get a reward at the end of it, so it's a, like it, it kind of makes sense to do because you're like, oh, it'll be effort, but then I'll get a really tasty thing um, at the end. And yeah, and I think Bake Off has just really helped. Like everyone have better ideas and like see that it is possible to like make really amazing things if you're just like an ordinary person. Well, we'll leave you to it and we'll see you later in society. So really, we just want to know how you think your cake went. Uh, I think my cake went pretty well. Uh, the roll was a bit kind of dodgy, but apart from that, I think it's quite good. Um, yeah, quite happy with it. Did you make my jams okay? Yeah, the jam's really good. Yeah, I tried the jam and if you try it, it's, it's really tasty. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> How excited are you to be at the Baking Society tonight? Pretty excited, like there's a lot of there's a lot of good bakes, so I'm pretty excited to try them all because they all look really interesting. So. So that's all for this episode of Society Spotlight. For EU TV, I've been Alistair Keen, and now I'm going to go and eat some more cake. Thanks, Alistair, for giving us a taste of what you've been up to. And that concludes our first episode. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we have. If you want to find out more about EU TV, find us on Facebook or on the USA website. Thanks for watching, and, and see, see you next time. time.